Chapter One of Windsor Castle, Book Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. Windsor Castle, Book Three, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Chapter One, comprising the first two epochs in the history of Windsor Castle. Amid the gloom hovering over the early history of Windsor Castle appeared the mighty phantoms of the renowned King Arthur and his knights, for whom it is said Merlin reared a magic fortress upon its heights, in a great hall whereof, decorated with trophies of war and of the chase, was placed the famous round table. But if the antique tale is now worn out, and no longer part of our faith, it is pleasant at least to record it, and surrendering ourselves for a while to the sway of fancy, to conjure up the old enchanted castle on the hill, to people its courts with warlike and lovely forms, its forests with fays and giants. Windsor, or Windleshore, so called from the winding banks of the river flowing past it, was the abode of the ancient Saxon monarchs, and a legend is related by William of Malmesbury, of a woodman named Woolwyn, who, being stricken with blindness, and having visited eighty-seven churches and vainly implored their tutelary saints for relief, was at last restored to sight by the touch of Edward the Confessor, who further enhanced the boon by making him keeper of his palace at Windsor. But though this story may be doubted, it is certain that the pious king above mentioned granted Windsor to the abbot and monks of St. Peter at Westminster, quote, for the hope of eternal reward, the remission of his sins, the sins of his father, mother, and all his ancestors, and to the praise of Almighty God, as a perpetual endowment and inheritance. Unquote. But the royal donation did not long remain in the hands of the priesthood. Struck by the extreme beauty of the spot, quote, for that it seemed exceeding profitable and commodious, because situate so near the Thames, the wood fit for game, and many other particulars lying there, meet and necessary for kings, yea, a place very convenient for his reception. Unquote. William the Conqueror prevailed upon Abbot Edwin to accept in exchange for it Wakendoon and Ferlings in Essex, together with three other tenements in Colchester. And having obtained possession of the coveted hill, he forthwith began to erect a castle upon it, occupying a space of about half a hide of land. Around it he formed large parks, to enable him to pursue his favorite pastime of hunting, and he enacted and enforced severe laws for the preservation of the game. As devoted to the chase as his father, William Rufus frequently hunted in the forests of Windsor, and solemnized some of the festivals of the church in the castle. In the succeeding reign, namely that of Henry I, the castle was entirely rebuilt and greatly enlarged, assuming somewhat of the character of a palatial residence, having before been little more than a strong hunting seat. The structure then erected in all probability occupied the same site as the upper and lower wards of the present pile, but nothing remains of it except perhaps the keep, and of that little beyond its form and position. In 1109, Henry celebrated the Feast of Pentecost with great state and magnificence within the castle. In 1122, he there espoused his second wife, Adelicia, daughter of Godfrey, Duke of Louvain, and failing in obtaining issue by her, assembled the barons at Windsor, and causing them, together with David, King of Scotland, his sister Adela, 
and her son Stephen, afterwards King of England, to do homage to his daughter Maud, widow of the Emperor Henry V. Proof that Windsor Castle was regarded as the second fortress in the realm is afforded by the Treaty of Peace between the usurper Stephen and the Empress Maud, in which it is coupled with the Tower of London under the designation of Malta de Windsor. At the signing of the treaty it was committed to the custody of Richard de Lucy, who was continued in the office of keeper by Henry the Second. In the reign of this monarch many repairs were made in the castle, to which a vineyard was attached, the cultivation of the grape being at this time extensively practiced throughout England. Strange as the circumstance may now appear, Stowe mentions that vines grew in abundance in the home park in the reign of Richard the Second, the wine made from them being consumed at the king's table and even sold. It is related by Fabian that Henry, stung by the disobedience and ingratitude of his sons, caused an allegorical picture to be painted representing an old eagle assailed by four young ones, which he placed in one of the chambers of the castle. When asked the meaning of the device, he replied, quote, I am the old eagle, and the four eaglets are my sons, who cease not to pursue my death. The youngest bird, who is tearing out its parents' eyes, is my son John, my youngest and best loved son, and who yet is the most eager for my destruction. Unquote. On his departure for the Holy Wars, Richard Coeur de Lyon entrusted the government of the castle to Hugh de Pozzi, Bishop of Durham and Earl of Northumberland. But a fierce dispute, arising between the warrior prelate and his ambitious colleague, William Longchamp, Bishop of Ila, he was seized and imprisoned by the latter and compelled to surrender the castle. After an extraordinary display of ostentation, Longchamp was ousted in his turn. On the arrival of the news of Richard's capture and imprisonment in Austria, the castle was seized by Prince John, but it was soon afterwards taken possession of in the king's behalf by the barons and consigned to the custody of Eleanor, the queen dowager. In John's reign, the castle became the scene of a foul and terrible event. William de Braus, a powerful baron, having offended the king, his wife Maud was ordered to deliver up her son a hostage for her husband. But instead of complying with the injunction, she rashly returned for answer, quote, that she would not entrust her child to the person who could slay his own nephew, unquote upon which the ruthless king seized her and her son and enclosing them in a recess in the wall of the castle built them up within it sorely pressed by the barons in 1215 john sought refuge within the castle and in the same year signed the two charters magna carta and carta de foresta at runnymede a plain between windsor and staines a curious account of his frantic demeanor after divesting himself of so much power and extending so greatly the liberties of the subject is given by Hollinshed. Quote, Having acted so far contrary to his mind, the king was right sorrowful in heart, cursed his mother that bare him, and the hour in which he was born, wishing that he had received death by violence of sword or knife instead of natural nourishment he wetted his teeth and did bite now on one staff now on another as he walked and oft break the same in pieces when he had done and with such disordered behavior and furious gestures he uttered his grief that the nobleman very well perceived the inclination of his inward affection concerning these things before the breaking up of the council and therefore sore lamented the state of the realm, guessing what would follow of his impatience and displeasant taking of the matter. Unquote. The faithless king 
made an attempt to regain his lost power and war breaking out afresh in the following year a numerous army under the command of william de nivernois besieged the castle which was stoutly defended by Inglehard de h and sixty knights the barons however learning that john was marching through norfolk and suffolk and ravaging the country hastily raised the siege and advanced to meet him but he avoided them marched to stamford and lincoln and from thence towards wales on his return from this expedition he was seized with the distemper of which he died henry the third was an ardent encourager of architecture and his reign marks the second great epoch in the annals of the castle in twelve twenty three eight hundred marks were paid to Engelhard de Sigoni, constable of the castle, John Le Draper, and William the Clerk of Windsor, masters of the works, and others, for repairs and works within the castle. The latter, it is conjectured, referring to the erection of a new great hall within the lower ward, there being already a hall of small dimensions in the upper court. The windows of the new building were filled with painted glass, and at the upper end, upon a raised dais, was a gilt throne sustaining a statue of the king in his robes. Within this vast and richly decorated chamber, in 1240, on the day of the Nativity, an infinite number of poor persons were collected and fed by the king's command. During the greater part of Henry's long and eventful reign, the works within the castle proceeded with unabated activity. Carpenters were maintained on the royal establishment. The ditch between the hall and the lower ward was repaired. A new kitchen was built. The bridges were repaired with timber procured from the neighboring forests. Certain breaches in the wall facing the garden were stopped. The fortifications were surveyed and the battlements repaired. At the same time, the queen's chamber was painted and wainscoted, and iron bars were placed before the windows of Prince Edward's chamber. In 1240, Henry commenced building an apartment for his own use near the wall of the castle, 60 feet long and 28 high, another apartment for the queen contiguous to it, and a chapel 70 feet long and 28 feet wide along the same wall, but with a grassy space between it and the royal apartments. The chapel, as appears from an order to Walter de Grey, Archbishop of York, had a Galilee and a cloister, a lofty wooden roof covered with lead, and a stone turret in front holding three or four bells. With inside it was made to appear like stonework with good ceiling and painting and it contained four gilded images. This structure is supposed to have been in existence under the designation of the old college church in the latter part of the reign of Henry the Seventh, by whom it was pulled down to make way for the tomb house. Traces of its architecture have been discovered by diligent antiquarian research in the south ambulatory of the dean's cloister and in the door behind the altar in St. George's Chapel, the latter of which is conceived to have formed the principal entrance to the older structure, and has been described as exhibiting, quote, one of the most beautiful specimens which time and innovation have respected of the elaborate ornamental work of the period, unquote. In 1241, Henry commenced operations upon the outworks of the castle, and the three towers on the western side of the lower ward, now known as the Curfew, the Garter, and the Salisbury Towers, were erected by him. He also continued the walls along the south side of the lower ward, traces of the architecture of the period being discoverable in the inner walls of the houses of the alms knights as far as the tower, now bearing his name. From thence, it is concluded that the ramparts ran along the east side of the upper ward to a tower occupying the site of the Wiccan 
or Winchester Tower. The three towers at the west end of the lower ward, though much dilapidated, present unquestionable features of the architecture of the 13th century. The lower story of the Curfew Tower, which has been but little altered, consists of a large vaulted chamber, 22 feet wide, with walls of nearly 13 feet in thickness, and having arched recesses terminated by loopholes. The walls are covered with the inscriptions of prisoners who have been confined within it. The garter tower, though in a most ruinous condition, exhibits high architectural beauty in its moulded arches and corbelled passages. The Salisbury Tower retains only externally, and on the side towards the town, its original aspect. The remains of a fourth tower are discernible in the governor of the Alms Knights Tower, and Henry the Third's Tower, as before observed, completes what remains of the original chain of fortifications. On the 24th of November, 1244, Henry issued a writ enjoining, quote, the clerks of the works at Windsor to work day and night to wainscot the high chamber upon the wall of the castle near our chapel in the upper bailey, so that it may be ready and properly wainscoted on Friday next, the 24th occurring on a Tuesday. Only two days were allowed for the task. When we come there, with boards radiated and colored, so that nothing be found reprehensible in the wainscot, and also to make at each gable of the said chamber one glass window, on the outside of the inner window of each gable, so that when the inner window shall be closed, the glass windows may be seen outside. Unquote. The following year, the works were suspended, but they were afterwards resumed and continued, with few interruptions. The keep was new constructed. A stone bench was fixed in the wall near the grass plot by the king's chamber. A bridge was thrown across the ditch to the king's garden, which lay outside the walls. A barbican was erected, to which a portcullis was subsequently attached. The bridges were defined by strong iron chains. The old chambers in the upper ward were renovated. A conduit and lavatory were added, and a fountain was constructed in the garden. In this reign, in all probability, the Norman Tower, which now forms a gateway between the middle and the upper ward, was erected. This tower, at present allotted to the housekeeper of the castle, Lady Mary Fox, was used as a prison lodging during the civil wars of Charles I's time, and many noble and gallant captives have left mementos of their loyalty and ill fate upon its walls. In 1260, Henry received a visit to Windsor from his daughter Margaret and her husband, Alexander III, King of Scotland. The queen gave birth to a daughter during her stay at the castle. In 1264, during the contest between Henry and the barons, the valiant Prince Edward, his son, returning from a successful expedition into Wales, surprised the citizens of London, and, carrying off their military chest, in which was much treasure, retired to Windsor Castle and strongly garrisoned it. The Queen Eleanor, his mother, would fain have joined him there but she was driven back by the citizens at London Bridge, and compelled to take sanctuary in the palace of the Bishop of London, at St. Paul's. Compelled at length to surrender the castle to the barons, and to depart from it with his consort, Eleanor of Castile, the brave prince soon afterwards recovered it, but was again forced to deliver it up to Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, who appointed Geoffrey de Langel governor. But though frequently wrested from him at this period, Windsor Castle was never long out of Henry's possession, and in 1265 the chief citizens of London were imprisoned till they had paid the heavy fine imposed upon them for their adherence to Simon de Montfort, who had been just before slain at the Battle of Evesham. 
During this rain, a terrific storm of wind and thunder occurred, which tore up several great trees in the park, shook the castle, and blew down a part of the building in which the queen and her family were lodged, but happily without doing them injury. Four of the children of Edward I, who was blessed with a numerous offspring, were born at Windsor, and as he frequently resided at the castle, the town began to increase in importance and consideration. By a charter granted in 1276, it was created a free borough, and various privileges were conferred on its inhabitants. Stowe tells us that in 1295, on the last day of February, there suddenly arose such a fire in the castle of Windsor that many offices were therewith consumed, and many goodly images, made to beautify the buildings, defaced and deformed. Edward the Second and his beautiful but perfidious queen, Isabella of France, made Windsor Castle their frequent abode, and here, on the 13th day of November 1312, at forty minutes past five in the morning, was born a prince, over whose nativity the wizard Merlin must have presided. Baptized within the old chapel by the name of Edward, this prince became afterwards the third monarch of the name, and the greatest, and was also styled from the place of his birth, Edward of Windsor. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Windsor Castle, Book Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Windsor Castle, Book Three, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Chapter Two comprising the third great epoch in the history of the castle, and showing how the most noble order of the garter was instituted. Strongly attached to the place of his birth, Edward III, by his letters patent dated from Westminster, in the twenty-second year of his reign, now founded the ancient chapel established by Henry I, and dedicated it to the Virgin, st george of cappadocia and st edward the confessor ordaining that to the eight canons appointed by his predecessor there should be added one custos fifteen more canons and twenty-four alms knights the whole to be maintained out of the revenues with which the chapel was to be endowed the institution was confirmed by pope clement the sixth by a bull issued at avignon the thirteenth of november thirteen fifty one in thirteen forty nine before the foundation of the college had been confirmed as above related edward instituted the order of the garter the origin of this illustrious order has been much disputed by some writers it has been ascribed to richard coeur de lion who is said to have girded a leathern band round the legs of his bravest knights in Palestine. By others it has been asserted that it arose from the word garter, having been used as a watchword by Edward at the Battle of Cressy. Others again have stoutly maintained that its ring-like form bore mysterious reference to the round table. But the popular legend, to which, despite the doubts thrown upon it, credence still attaches declares its origin to be as follows joan countess of salisbury a beautiful dame of whom edward was enamoured while dancing at a high festival accidentally slipped her garter of blue embroidered velvet it was picked up by her royal partner who noticing the significant looks of his courtiers on the occasion used the words to them which afterwards became the motto of the order on y soi qui mal y pense adding that in a short time they should see that garter advanced to so high honour and estimation as to account themselves happy to wear it but whatever may have originated the order it unquestionably owes its establishment to motives of policy 
wise as valiant and bent upon prosecuting his claim to the crown of france edward as a means of accomplishing his object resolved to collect beneath his standard the best knights in europe and to lend a colour to the design he gave forth that he intended a restoration of king arthur's round table and accordingly commenced constructing within the castle a large circular building of two hundred feet in diameter in which he placed a round table on the completion of the work he issued proclamations throughout england scotland france burgundy flanders brabant and the empire inviting all knights desirous of approving their valour to a solemn feast and jousts to be holden within the castle of windsor on st george's day thirteen forty five the scheme was completely successful the flower of the chivalry of europe excepting that of philip the sixth of france who seeing through the design interdicted the attendance of his knights were present at the tournament which was graced by edward and his chief nobles together with his queen and three hundred of her fairest dames adorned with all imaginable gallantry at this chivalrous convocation the institution of the order of the garter was arranged but before its final establishment edward assembled his principal barons and knights to determine upon the regulations when it was decided that the number should be limited to twenty-six the first installation took place on the anniversary of st george the patron of the order thirteen forty nine when the king accompanied by the twenty-five knights companions attired in gowns of russet with mantles of fine blue woollen cloth powdered with garters and bearing the other insignia of the order marched bareheaded in solemn procession to the chapel of st george then recently rebuilt where mass was performed by william eddington bishop of winchester after which they partook of a magnificent banquet the festivities were continued for several days at the jousts held on this occasion david king of scotland the lord charles of blois and ralph earl of eu and Gisney, and constable of france to whom the chief prize of the day was adjudged with others then prisoners attended the harness of the king of scotland embroidered with a pail of red velvet and beneath it a red rose was provided at edward's own charge this suit of armour was until a few years back preserved in the round tower where the royal prisoner was confined edward's device was a white swan gorged or with the daring and inviting motto hey hey the white swan by god's soul i am thy man the insignia of the order in the days of its founder were the garter mantle surcoat and hood the george and collar being added by henry the eighth the mantle as before intimated was originally of fine blue woollen cloth but velvet lined with taffeta was substituted by henry the sixth the left shoulder being adorned with the arms of st george embroidered within a garter little is known of the materials of which the early garter was composed but it is supposed to have been adorned with gold and fastened with a buckle of the same metal the modern garter is of blue velvet bordered with gold wire and embroidered with the motto honey swa qui mel e pence it is worn on the left leg a little below the knee the most magnificent garter that ever graced a sovereign was that presented to charles the first by gustavus adolphus king of sweden each letter in the motto of which was composed of diamonds the collar is formed of pieces of gold fashioned like garters with a blue enamelled ground the letters of the motto are in gold with a rose enamelled red in the centre of each garter from the collar hangs the george an ornament enriched with precious stones and displaying the figure of the saint encountering the dragon the officers of the order are the prelate represented by the bishop of winchester the chancellor by the bishop of oxford 
the registrar dean garter king at arms and the usher of the black rod among the foreign potentates who have been invested with the order are eight emperors of germany two of russia five kings of france three of spain one of aragon seven of portugal one of poland two of sweden six of denmark two of naples one of sicily and jerusalem one of bohemia two of scotland seven princes of orange and many of the most illustrious personages of different ages in europe truly hath the learned selden written that the order of the garter hath not only precedency of antiquity before the eldest rank of honour of that kind anywhere established but it exceeds in majesty honour and fame all chivalrous orders in the world well also hath glorious dryden in the flower and leaf sung the praises of the illustrious institution behold an order yet of newer date doubling their number equal in their state our england's ornament the crown's defence in battle brave protectors of their prince unchanged by fortune to their sovereign true for which their manly legs are bound in blue these of the garter called of faith unstained in fighting fields the laurel have obtained and well repaid the laurels which they gained in thirteen fifty seven john king of france defeated at the battle of poitiers by edward the black prince was brought captive to windsor and on the festival of st george in the following year thirteen fifty eight edward outshone all his former splendid doings by a tournament which he gave in honour of his royal prisoner proclamation having been made as before and letters of safe conduct issued the nobles and knighthood of almaine gascon scotland and other countries flocked to attend it the queen of scotland edward's sister was present at the jousts and it is said that john commenting upon the splendour of the spectacle shrewdly observed that he never saw or knew such royal shows and feastings without some after reckoning the same monarch replied to his kingly captor who sought to rouse him from dejection on another occasion quomodo cantabimus canticum in terra aliena that his works might not be retarded for want of hands edward in the twenty-fourth year of his reign appointed john de Sponley master of the stone hewers with a power not only to take and keep as well within the liberties as without as many masons and other artificers as were necessary and to convey them to windsor but to arrest and imprison such as should disobey or refuse with a command to all sheriffs mayors bailiffs etc to assist him these powers were fully acted upon at a later period when some of the workmen having left their employment were thrown into newgate while the place of others who had been carried off by a pestilence then raging in the castle was supplied by impressment in thirteen fifty six william of wykeham was constituted superintendent of the works with the same powers as john de Sponley and his appointment marks an important era in the annals of the castle originally secretary to edward the third this remarkable man became bishop of winchester and prelate of the garter when he solicited the bishopric it is said that edward told him he was neither a priest nor a scholar to which he replied that he would soon be the one and in regard to the other he would make more scholars than all the bishops of england ever did he made good his word by founding the collegiate school at winchester and erecting new college at oxford when the winchester tower was finished he caused the words hoc fecit wykeham to be carved upon it and the king offended at his presumption wykeham turned away his displeasure by declaring that the inscription meant that the castle had made him and not that he had made the castle it is a curious coincidence that this tower after a lapse of four centuries and a half should become the residence of an architect possessing the genius of wykeham and who like him 
had rebuilt the kingly edifice, Sir Geoffrey Wyatville. William of Wycombe retired from office, loaded with honours, in 1362, and was succeeded by William de Musso. He was interred in the cathedral at Winchester. His arms were argent, two chevrons, sable, between three roses, gules, with the motto, Manners maketh man. In 1359, Holinshed relates that the king set workmen in hand to take down much old buildings belonging to the castle, and caused diverse other fine and sumptuous works to be set up in and about the same castle, so that almost all the masons and carpenters that were of any account in the land were sent for and employed about the same works. The old buildings here referred to were probably the remains of the palace and keep of Henry I in the middle ward. As the original chapel dedicated to St. George was demolished by Edward IV, its position and form cannot be clearly determined but a conjecture has been hazarded that it occupied the same ground as the choir of the present chapel and extended farther eastward upon the question of its style says mr pointer from whose valuable account of the castle much information has been derived there is the evidence of two fragments discovered near this site a corbel and a piscina ornamented with foliage strongly characteristic of the decorated english gothic and indicating by the remains of colour on their surfaces that they belonged to an edifice adorned in the polychromatic style so elaborately developed in the chapel already built by edward the third at westminster the royal lodgings st george's hall the buildings on the east and north sides of the upper ward the round tower the canons' houses in the lower ward, and the whole circumference of the castle, exclusive of the towers erected in Henry the Third's reign, were now built. Among the earlier works in Edward's reign is the dean's cloister. The square of the upper ward, added by this monarch, occupied a space of four hundred and twenty feet, and encroached somewhat upon the middle ward. Externally the walls presented a grim, rectangular appearance broken only by the buttresses and offering no other apertures than the narrow loopholes and gateways some traces of the architecture of the period may still be discerned in the archway and machiculus of the principal gateway adjoining the round tower the basement chamber of the devil tower or edward the third's tower and in the range of groined and four-centred vaulting extending along the north side of the upper quadrangle from the kitchen gateway to king john's tower in thirteen fifty nine queen philippa consort of edward the third breathed her last in windsor castle richard the second grandson of edward the third frequently kept his court at windsor here in thirteen eighty two it was determined by council that war should be declared against france and here sixteen years later on a scaffold erected within the castle the famous appeal for high treason was made by henry of lancaster duke of hereford against thomas mowbray duke of norfolk the latter of whom defied his accuser to mortal combat the duel was stopped by the king and the adversaries banished but the Duke of Lancaster afterwards returned to depose his banisher. About the same time, the citizens of London having refused Richard a large loan, he summoned the Lord Mayor, sheriffs, aldermen, and twenty-four of the principal citizens, to his presence, and after rating them soundly, ordered them all into custody, imprisoning the Lord Mayor in the castle in this reign geoffrey chaucer the father of english poetry was appointed clerk to the works of st george's chapel at a salary of two shillings per day a sum equal to six hundred fifty seven pounds per annum of modern money with the same arbitrary power as had been granted to previous surveyors to impress carpenters and masons chaucer did not retain his appointment more than twenty months 
and was succeeded by john gedney it was at windsor that henry the fourth scarcely assured of the crown he had seized received intelligence of a conspiracy against his life from the traitorous Amerly, who purchased his own safety at the expense of his confederates a timely warning enabled the king to baffle the design it was in windsor also that the children of mortimer earl of march the rightful successor to the throne were detained as hostages for their father liberated by the countess dowager of gloucester who contrived to open their prison door with false keys the youthful captives escaped to the marshes of wales where however they were overtaken by the emissaries of henry and brought back to their former place of confinement a few years later another illustrious prisoner was brought to windsor namely prince james the son of king robert the third and afterwards james the first of scotland this prince remained a captive for upwards of eighteen years not being released till fourteen twenty four in the second of henry the sixth by the duke of bedford then regent james's captivity and his love for jane of beaufort daughter of the duke of somerset and granddaughter to john of gaunt to whom he was united have breathed a charm over the round tower where he was confined and his memory like that of the chivalrous and poetical surrey whom he resembled in character and accomplishments will be ever associated with it in the king's quair the royal poet has left an exquisite picture of a garden nook contrived within the dry moat of the dungeon now was there made fast by the tower's wall a garden fair and in the corners set an arbor green with wandis long and small railed about and so with leaves beset was all the place and hawthorn hedges net that life was none walking there forby that might within scarce any white espy so thick the branches and the leaves green beshaded all the alleys that there were and midst of every harbour might be seen the sharp green sweet juniper growing so fair with branches here and there that as it seemed to a life without the boughs did spread the arbour all about and he thus describes the first appearance of the lovely jane and the effect produced upon him by her charms and therewith cast i down my eye again whereas i saw walking under the tower full secretly new comin her to plain the fairest and the freshest young flower that e'er i saw methought before that hour for which sudden abate anon did start the blood of all my body to my heart henry v occasionally kept his court at windsor and in fourteen sixteen entertained with great magnificence the emperor sigismund who brought with him an invaluable relic the heart of st george which he bestowed upon the chapter the emperor was at the same time invested with the order in fourteen twenty one the unfortunate henry the sixth was born within the castle and in fourteen eighty four he was interred within it End of section 2book three by william harrison ainsworth chapter three comprising the fourth epoch in the history of the castle and showing how st george's chapel was rebuilt by king edward the fourth finding the foundation and walls of st george's chapel much dilapidated and decayed edward the fourth resolved to pull down the pile and to build a larger and statelier structure in its place 
with this view he constituted richard beauchamp bishop of salisbury surveyor of the works from whose designs arose the present beautiful edifice to enable the bishop to accomplish the work power was given him to remove all obstructions and to enlarge the space by the demolition of the three buildings then commonly called clure's tower burner's tower and the almoner's tower the zeal and assiduity with which beauchamp prosecuted his task is adverted to in the patent of his appointment to the office of chancellor of the garter the preamble whereof recites that out of mere love towards the order he had given himself the leisure daily to attend the advancement and progress of this goodly fabric the chapel however was not completed in one reign or by one architect sir reginald bray prime minister of henry the seventh succeeded bishop beauchamp as surveyor of the works and it was by him that the matchless roof of the choir and other parts of the fabric were built indeed the frequent appearance of bray's arms sometimes single sometimes impaling his alliances in many parts of the ceiling and windows has led to the supposition that he himself contributed largely to the expense of the work the groined ceiling of the chapel was not commenced till the twenty-seventh year of the reign of henry the seventh when the pinnacles of the roof were decorated with veins supported by gilt figures of lions antelopes greyhounds and dragons the want of which is still a detriment to the external beauty of the structure the main vaulting of st george's chapel says mr pointer is perhaps without exception the most beautiful specimen of the gothic stone roof in existence but it has been very improperly classed with those of the same architectural period in the chapels of king's college cambridge and henry the seventh at westminster the roofing of the aisle and the centre compartment of the body of the building are indeed in that style but the vault of the nave and choir differ essentially from fan vaulting both in drawing and construction it is in fact a wagon-headed vault broken by welsh groins that is to say groins which cut into the main arch below the apex it is not singular in the principle of its design but it is unique in its proportions in which the exact mean seems to be attained between the poverty and monotony of a wagon-headed ceiling and the ungraceful effect of a mere groined roof with a depressed roof or large span to which may be added that with a richness of effect scarcely if at all inferior to fan tracery it is free from those abrupt junctions of the lines and other defects of drawing inevitable when the length and breadth of the compartments of fan vaulting differ very much of which king's college chapel exhibits some notable instances supported by these exquisite ribs and groins the ceiling is decorated with heraldic insignia displaying the arms of edward the confessor edward the third edward the black prince henry the sixth edward the fourth henry the seventh and henry the eighth with the arms of england and france quartered the holy cross the shield or cross of st george the rose portcullis lion rampant unicorn fleur-de-lis dragon and prince's feathers together with the arms of a multitude of noble families in the nave are emblazoned the arms of henry the eighth and of several knights companions among which are those of charles the fifth francis the first and ferdinand enfant of spain the extreme lightness and graceful proportions of the pillars lining the aisles contribute greatly to the effect of this part of the structure beautiful however as is the body of the chapel it is not comparable to the choir here and on either side are ranged the stalls of the knights formerly twenty-six in number but now increased to thirty-two elaborately carved in black oak 
and covered by canopies of the richest tabernacle work, supported by slender pillars. On the pedestals is represented the history of the Saviour, and on the front of the stalls at the west end of the choir is carved the legend of St. George, while on the outside of the upper seat is cut, in old Saxon characters, the twentieth psalm in Latin. On the canopies of the stalls are placed the mantle, helmet, coat, and sword of the knight's companions, and above them are hung their emblazoned banners. On the back of each stall are fixed small enameled plates, graven with the titles of the knights who have occupied it. The ancient stall of the sovereign was removed in 1788, and a new seat erected. The altar was formerly adorned with costly hangings of crimson velvet and gold, but these, together with the consecrated vessels of great value, were seized by order of Parliament in 1642 amid the general plunder of the foundation. The service of the altar was replaced by Charles the Second. The sovereign's stall is immediately on the right on the entrance to the choir, and the prince's on the left. The queen's closet is on the north side above the altar. Beneath it is the beautiful and elaborately wrought framework of iron, representing a pair of gates between two Gothic towers, designed as a screen to the tomb of Edward IV, and which, though popularly attributed to Quintin Matsys, has with more justice been assigned to Master John Tresillian. One great blemish to the chapel exists in the window over the altar, the mullions and tracery of which have been removed to make way for dull colourless copies in painted glass of West's designs. Instead of blushing with the blood of kings and twilight saints and dim emblazonings, steeping the altar in rich suffusion, checkering the walls and pavement with variegated hues, and filling the whole sacred spot with a warm and congenial glow, these panes produce a cold, cheerless, and most disagreeable effect. The removal of this objectionable feature, and the restoration of framework and compartments in the style of the original, and enriched with ancient mellow-toned and many-hued glass in keeping with the place, are absolutely indispensable to the completeness and unity of character of the chapel. Two clerestory windows at the east end of the choir, adjoining the larger window, have been recently filled with stained glass in much better taste. The objections above made may be urged with equal force against the east and west windows of the south aisle of the body of the fane, and the west window of the north aisle. The glorious west window, composed of eighty compartments, embellished with figures of kings, patriarchs, and bishops, together with the insignia of the garter and the arms of the prelates, the wreck gathered from all the other windows, and streaming with the radiance of the setting sun upon the broad nave and graceful pillars of the aisles, this superb window, an admirable specimen of the architecture of the age in which it was designed, had well nigh shared the fate of the others, and was only preserved from desecration by the circumstance of the death of the glass painter. The mullions of this window being found much decayed, were carefully and consistently restored during the last year by Mr. Blore, and the ancient stained glass replaced. Not only does St. George's Chapel form a house of prayer and a temple of chivalry, but it is also the burial place of kings. At the east end of the north aisle of the choir is a plain flag, bearing the words, King Edward the Fourth, and his Queen Elizabeth Whitville. The coat of mail and surcoat, decorated with rubies and precious stones, together with other rich trophies once ornamenting this tomb, were carried off by the parliamentary plunderers. Edward's queen, Elizabeth Woodville, it was thought, slept beside him. But when the royal tomb was opened in 1789, 
and the two coffins within it examined, the smaller one was found empty. The queen's body was subsequently discovered in a stone coffin by workmen employed in excavating the vault for George the Third. Edward's coffin was seven feet long, and contained a perfect skeleton. On the opposite aisle, near the choir door, as already mentioned, rests the ill-fated Henry the Sixth beneath an arch sumptuously embellished by Henry the Eighth on the keystone of which may still be seen his arms supported by two antelopes connected by a golden chain henry's body was removed from chertsey where it was first interred and reburied in fourteen eighty four with much solemnity in this spot such was the opinion entertained of his sanctity that miracles were supposed to be wrought upon his tomb and henry the seventh applied to have him canonized but the demands of the pope were too exorbitant the proximity of henry and edward in death suggested the following lines to pope here or the martyred king the marble weeps and fast beside him once feared edward sleeps the grave unites where e'en the grave finds rest and mingled here the oppressor and the oppressed in the royal vault in the choir repose henry the eighth and his third queen jane seymour together with the martyred charles the first space only permits the hasty enumeration of the different chapels and chantries adorning this splendid fane these are lincoln chapel near which richard beauchamp bishop of salisbury is buried oxenbridge chapel aldworth chapel bray chapel where rests the body of sir reginald de bray the architect of the pile beaufort chapel containing sumptuous monuments of the noble family of that name rutland chapel hastings chapel and urswick chapel in which is now placed the cenotaph of the princess charlotte sculptured by matthew wyatt in a vault near the sovereign's stall lie the remains of the duke of gloucester who died in eighteen o five and of his duchess who died two years after him and near the entrance of the south door is a slab of gray marble beneath which lies one who in his day filled the highest offices of the realm and was the brother of a king and the husband of a queen it is inscribed with the great name of charles brandon at the east end of the north aisle is the chapter house in which is a portrait and the sword of state of edward the third adjoining the chapel on the east stands the royal tomb house commenced by henry the seventh as a mausoleum but abandoned for the chapel in westminster abbey this structure was granted by henry the eighth to wolsey who intending it as a place of burial for himself erected within it a sumptuous monument of black and white marble with eight large brazen columns placed around it and four others in the form of candlesticks at the time of the cardinal's disgrace when the building reverted to the crown the monument was far advanced towards completion the vast sum of four thousand two hundred eighty ducats having been paid to benedetto a florentine sculptor for work and nearly four hundred pounds for gilding part of it this tomb was stripped of its ornaments and destroyed by the parliamentary rebels in sixteen forty six but the black marble sarcophagus forming part of it and intended as a receptacle for wolsey's own remains escaped destruction and now covers the grave of nelson in a crypt of st paul's cathedral henry the eighth was not interred in this mausoleum but in st george's chapel as has just been mentioned and as he himself directed midway between the state and the high altar full instructions were left by him for the erection of a monument which if it had been completed would have been truly magnificent the pavement was to be of oriental stones 
with two great steps upon it of the same material. The two pillars of the church between which the tomb was to be set were to be covered with bas-reliefs, representing the chief events of the Old Testament, angels with gilt garlands, fourteen images of the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, and the four doctors of the church, and at the foot of every image a little child with a basket full of red and white roses enameled and gilt. Between these pillars, on a basement of white marble, the epitaphs of the king and queen were to be written in letters of gold. On the same basement were to be two tombs of black touchstone supporting the images of the king and queen, not as dead, but sleeping, to show, so runs the order, that famous princes leaving behind them great fame do never die. On the right hand, at either corner of the tomb, was to be an angel holding the king's arms, with a great candlestick, and at the opposite corners two other angels bearing the queen's arms and candlesticks. Between the two black tombs was to rise a high basement, like a sepulchre, surmounted by a statue of the king on horseback, in armor. Both figures to be of the whole stature of a goodly man and a large horse. Over this statue was to be a canopy, like a triumphal arch, of white marble, garnished with oriental stones of diverse colors, with the history of St. John the Baptist wrought in gilt brass upon it, with a crowning group of the father holding the soul of the king in his right hand and the soul of the queen in his left, and blessing them. The height of the monument was to be twenty-eight feet. The number of statues was to be one hundred and thirty-four, with forty-four bas-reliefs. It would be matter of infinite regret that this great design was never executed, if its destruction by the parliamentary plunderers would not in that case have been also matter of certainty. Charles I intended to fit up this structure as a royal mausoleum, but was diverted from the plan by the outbreak of the Civil War. It was afterwards used as a chapel by James II, and Mass was publicly performed in it. The ceiling was painted by Vario, and the walls highly ornamented, but the decorations were greatly injured by the fury of an anti-Catholic mob, who assailed the building, and destroyed its windows, on the occasion of a banquet given to the Pope's nuncio by the king. In this state it continued till the commencement of the present century, when the exterior was repaired by George the Third and a vault, seventy feet in length, twenty-eight in width, and fourteen in depth, constructed within it, for the reception of the royal family. Catacombs, formed of massive octangular pillars, and supporting ranges of shelves, line the walls on either side. At the eastern extremity there are five niches, and in the middle twelve low tombs. A subterranean passage leads from the vault beneath the choir of St. George's altar to the sepulchre. Within it are deposited the bodies of George the Third and Queen Charlotte, the princesses Amelia and Charlotte, the Dukes of Kent and York, and the last two sovereigns, George the Fourth and William the Fourth. But to return to the reign of Edward the Fourth, from which the desire to bring down the history of St. George's Chapel to the present time has led to the foregoing digression. About the same time that the chapel was built, habitations for the dean and canons were erected on the northeast of the fane, while another range of dwellings for the minor canons was built at its west end, disposed in the form of a fetterlock, one of the badges of Edward the Fourth, and since called the Horseshoe Cloisters. The ambulatory of these cloisters once displayed a fine specimen of the timber architecture of Henry the Seventh's time, when they were repaired, but little of their original character can now be discerned. In 1482, Edward, 
desirous of advancing his popularity with the citizens of london invited the lord mayor and aldermen to windsor where he feasted them royally and treated them to the pleasures of the chase sending them back to their spouses loaded with game in fourteen eighty four richard the third kept the feast of st george at windsor and the building of the chapel was continued during his reign the picturesque portion of the castle on the north side of the upper ward near the norman gateway and which is one of the noblest gothic features of the proud pile was built by henry the seventh whose name it still bears the side of this building looking towards the terrace was originally decorated with two rich windows but one of them has disappeared and the other has suffered much damage in fifteen hundred the deanery was rebuilt by dean urswick at the lower end of the court adjoining the canons houses behind the horseshoe cloisters stands the collegiate library the date of which is uncertain though it may perhaps be referred to this period the establishment was enriched in later times by a valuable library bequeathed to it by the earl of ranelagh in fifteen o six windsor was the scene of great festivity in consequence of the unexpected arrival of philip king of castile and his queen who had been driven by stress of weather into weymouth the royal visitors remained for several weeks at the castle during which it continued a scene of revelry intermixed with the sports of the chase at the same time philip was invested with the order of the garter and installed in the chapel of st george the great gateway to the lower ward was built in the commencement of the reign of henry the eighth it is decorated with his arms and devices the rose portcullis and fleur-de-lis and with the bearings of catherine of aragon in fifteen twenty two charles v visited windsor and was installed knight of the garter during a period of dissension in the council edward the sixth was removed for safety to windsor by the lord protector somerset and here at a later period the youthful monarch received a letter from the council urging the dismissal of somerset with which by the advice of the archbishop of canterbury he complied in this reign an undertaking to convey water to the castle from blackmoor park near wingfield a distance of five miles was commenced though it was not till fifteen fifty five in the time of mary that the plan was accomplished when a pipe was brought into the upper ward and there the water plenteous did rise thirteen feet high in the middle of the court was erected a magnificent fountain consisting of a canopy raised upon columns gorgeously decorated with heraldic ornaments and surmounted by a great vane with the arms of philip and mary impaled upon it and supported by a lion and an eagle gilt and painted the water was discharged by a great dragon one of the supporters of the tudor arms into the cistern beneath whence it was conveyed by pipes to every part of the castle mary held her court at windsor soon after her union with philip of spain about this period the old habitations of the alms knights on the south side of the lower quadrangle were taken down and others erected in their stead fewer additions were made to windsor castle by elizabeth than might have been expected from her predilection for it as a place of residence she extended and widened the north terrace where when lodging within the castle she daily took exercise whatever might be the weather the terrace at this time as it is described by paul hensner and as it appears in norden's view was a sort of balcony projecting beyond the scarp of the hill and supported by great cantilevers of wood in fifteen seventy six the gallery still bearing her name and lying between henry the seventh's buildings and the norman tower was erected by elizabeth 
this portion of the castle had the good fortune to escape the alterations and modifications made in almost every other part of the upper ward after the restoration of charles the second it now forms the library a large garden was laid out by the same queen and a small gateway on castle hill built by her which afterwards became one of the greatest obstructions to the approach and it was taken down by george the fourth elizabeth often hunted in the parks and exhibited her skill in archery which was by no means inconsiderable at the butts her fondness for dramatic performances likewise induced her to erect a stage within the castle on which plays and interludes were performed and to her admiration of the character of falstaff and her love of the locality the world is indebted for the merry wives of windsor james i favoured windsor as much as his predecessors caroused within its halls and chased the deer in its parks christian the fourth of denmark was sumptuously entertained by him at windsor in this reign a curious dispute occurred between the king and the dean and chapter respecting the repair of a breach in the wall which was not brought to issue for three years when after much argument it was decided in favour of the clergy little was done at windsor by charles i until the tenth year of his reign when a banqueting-house erected by elizabeth was taken down and the magnificent fountain constructed by queen mary demolished two years afterwards a pyramid or lantern with a clock bell and dial was ordered to be set up in front of the castle and a balcony was erected before the room where henry the sixth was born in the early part of the year sixteen forty two charles retired to windsor to shield himself from the insults of the populace and was followed by a committee of the house of commons who prevailed upon him to desist from the prosecution of the impeached members on the twenty third of october in the same year captain fogg at the head of a parliamentarian force demanded the keys of the college treasury and not being able to obtain them forced open the doors and carried off the whole of the plate the plunder of the college was completed by vane the parliamentary governor of the castle who seized upon the whole of the furniture and decorations of the choir rifled the tomb of edward the fourth stripped off all the costly ornament from wolsey's tomb defaced the emblazonings over henry the sixth's grave broke the rich painted glass of the windows and wantonly destroyed the exquisite woodwork of the choir towards the close of the year sixteen forty eight the ill-fated charles was brought a prisoner to windsor where he remained while preparations were made for the execrable tragedy soon afterwards enacted after the slaughter of the martyr monarch the castle became the prison of the earl of norwich lord capel and the duke of hamilton and other royalists and cavaliers cromwell frequently resided within the castle and often took a moody and distrustful walk upon the terrace it was during the protectorate in sixteen seventy seven that the ugly buildings appropriated to the naval knights and standing between the garter tower and chancellor's tower were erected by sir francis crane end of chapter three chapter four of windsor castle book three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org windsor castle book three by william harrison ainsworth chapter four 
containing the history of the castle from the reign of Charles the Second to that of George the Third, with a few particulars concerning the parks and forest. Windsor Castle On the restoration the castle resumed its splendor, and presented a striking contrast to the previous gloomy period. The terrace, with its festive groups, resembled a picture by Watteau, the courts resounded with laughter, and the velvet sod of the home park was as often pressed by the foot of frolic beauty as by that of tripping deer. Seventeen state apartments were erected by Sir Christopher Wren, under the direction of Sir John Denham. The ceilings were painted by Vario, and the walls decorated with exquisite carvings by Grinling Gibbons. A grand staircase was added at the same time. Most of the chambers were hung with tapestry, and all adorned with pictures and costly furniture. The addition made to the castle by Charles was part of the north front, then called the Star Building, from the star of the Order of the Garter worked in colors in the front of it, but now denominated the Stuart Building, extending eastward along the terrace from Henry the Seventh's building one hundred and seventy feet. In sixteen seventy six the ditch was filled up, and the terrace carried along the south and east fronts of the castle. Meanwhile the original character of the castle was completely destroyed and Italianized. The beautiful and picturesque irregularities of the walls were removed, the towers shaved off, the windows transformed into commonplace circular-headed apertures. And so the castle remained for more than a century. Edward III's Tower indifferently called the earl marshal's tower and the devil tower and used as a place of confinement for state prisoners was now allotted to the maids of honor it was intended by charles to erect a monument in honor of his martyred father on the site of the tomb house which he proposed to remove and seventy thousand pounds were voted by parliament for this purpose the design however was abandoned under the plea that the body could not be found, though it was perfectly well known where it lay. The real motive, probably, was that Charles had already spent the money. In 1680 an equestrian statue of Charles the Second, executed by Strada, at the expense of Tobias Rustat, formerly housekeeper at Hampton Court, was placed in the centre of the upper ward. It now stands at the lower end of the same court. The sculptures on the pedestal were designed by Grinling Gibbons, and Horace Walpole pleasantly declared that the statue had no other merit than to attract attention to them. In old times a road, forming a narrow irregular avenue, ran through the woods from the foot of the castle to Snow Hill, but this road having been neglected during a long series of years, the branches of the trees and underwood had so much encroached upon it as to render it wholly impassable. A grand avenue, two hundred and forty feet wide, was planned by Charles in its place, and the magnificent approach called the Long Walk laid out and planted. The only material incident connected with the castle during the reign of James the Second has already been related. Windsor was not so much favoured as Hampton Court by William the Third, though he contemplated alterations within it during the latter part of his life which it may be matter of rejoicing were never accomplished. Queen Anne's operations were chiefly directed towards the parks, in improving which nearly forty thousand pounds were expended. In 1707 the extensive avenue running almost parallel with the Long Walk, and called the Queen's Walk, was planted by her, and three years afterwards a carriage road was formed through the Long Walk. A garden was also planted on the north side of the castle. 
in this reign sir james thornhill commenced painting charles the second's staircase with designs from ovid's metamorphosis but did not complete his task till after the ascension of george the first this staircase was removed in eighteen hundred to make way for the present gothic entrance erected by the elder wyatt the first two monarchs of the house of hanover rarely used windsor as a residence preferring hampton court and a kensington and even george the third did not actually live in the castle but in the queen's lodge a large detached building with no pretension to architectural beauty which he himself erected opposite the south terrace at a cost of nearly forty four thousand pounds with most praiseworthy zeal and almost entirely at his own expense this monarch undertook the restoration of st george's chapel the work was commenced in seventeen eighty seven occupied three years and was executed by mr emlyn a local architect the whole building was repaved a new altar screen and organ added and the carving restored in seventeen ninety six mr james wyatt was appointed surveyor general of the royal buildings and effected many internal arrangements externally he restored wren's round-headed windows to their original form and at the same time gothicized a large portion of the north and south sides of the upper ward before proceeding further a word must be said about the parks the home park which lies on the east and north sides of the castle is about four miles in circumference and was enlarged and enclosed with a brick wall by william the third on the east and nearly on the site of the present sunk garden a bowling green was laid out by charles the second below on the north were queen anne's gardens since whose time the declivity of the hill has been planted with forest trees at the east angle of the north terrace are the beautiful slopes with a path skirting the north side of the home park and leading through charming plantations in the direction of the royal farm and dairy the ranger's lodge and the kennel for the queen's harriers this park contains many noble trees and the grove of elms in the southeast near the spot where the scathed oak assigned to herne stands is traditionally asserted to have been a favourite walk of queen elizabeth it still retains her name the great park is approached by the magnificent avenue called the long walk laid out as has been stated by charles the second and extending to the foot of snow hill the summit of which is crowned by the colossal equestrian statue of george the third by westmacott not far from this point stands cumberland lodge which derives its name from william duke of cumberland to whom it was granted in seventeen forty four according to norden's survey in sixteen o seven this park contained three thousand fifty acres but when surveyed by george the third it was found to consist of three thousand eight hundred acres of which two hundred were covered with water at that time the park was overgrown with ferns and rushes and abounded in bogs and swamps which in many places were dangerous and almost impassable it contained about three thousand head of deer in bad condition the park has since been thoroughly drained smoothed and new planted in parts and two farms have been introduced upon it under the direction of mr kent at which the flemish and norfolk modes of husbandry have been successfully practised boasting every variety of forest scenery and commanding from its knolls and acclivities magnificent views of the castle the great park is traversed in all directions by green drives threading its long vistas or crossing its open glades laid out by george the fourth amid the groves at the back of spring hill in a charmingly sequestered situation stands a small private chapel built in the gothic style 
and which was used as a place of devotion by George the Fourth during the progress of the improvements at the castle, and is sometimes attended by the present queen. Not the least of the attractions of the park is Virginia Water, with its bright and beautiful expanse, its cincture of green banks, soft and smooth as velvet, its screen of noble woods, its Chinese fishing temple, its frigates, its ruins, its cascade, cave, and druidical temple, its obelisk and bridges, with numberless beauties besides, which it would be superfluous to describe here. This artificial mirror covers pretty nearly the same surface of ground as that occupied by the great lake of olden times. Windsor Forest once comprehended a circumference of a hundred and twenty miles, and comprised part of Buckinghamshire, a considerable portion of Surrey, and the whole southeast side of Berkshire, as far as Hungerford. On the Surrey side it included Cobham and Chertsey, and extended along the side of the way, which marked its limits as far as Guildford. In the reign of James I, when it was surveyed by Norton, its circuit was estimated at seventy-seven miles and a half, exclusive of the liberties extending into Buckinghamshire. There were fifteen walks within it, each under the charge of a head-keeper, and the whole contained upwards of three thousand head of deer. It is now almost wholly enclosed. End of chapter 4chapter five of windsor castle book three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org windsor castle book three by william harrison ainsworth chapter five the last great epoch in the history of the castle a prince of consummate taste and fine conceptions george the fourth meditated and what is better accomplished the restoration of the castle to more than its original grandeur he was singularly fortunate in his architect sir geoffrey wyatville was to him what william of wykeham had been to edward the third all the incongruities of successive reigns were removed all or nearly all the injuries inflicted by time repaired and when the work so well commenced was finished the structure took its place as the noblest and most majestic palatial residence in existence to enter into a full detail of wyatville's achievements is beyond the scope of the present work but a brief survey may be taken of them never was lofty design more fully realized view the castle on the north with its grand terrace of nearly a thousand feet in length and high embattled walls its superb facade comprehending the stately brunswick tower the cornwall tower with its gorgeous window george the fourth's tower including the great oriel window of the state drawing-room the restored stuart buildings and those of henry the seventh and of elizabeth the renovated norman tower the powder tower with the line of walls as far as the winchester tower view this and then turn to the east and behold another front of marvellous beauty extending more than four hundred feet from north to south and displaying the prince of wales's tower the chester clarence and victoria towers all of which have been raised above their former level and enriched by great projecting windows behold also the beautiful sunken garden with its fountain and orangery its flight of steps and charming pentagonal terrace proceed to the south front of which the victoria tower with its machicolated battlements and oriel window forms so superb a feature at the eastern corner 
the magnificent gateway receiving its name from george the fourth flanked by the york and lancaster towers and opening in a continued line from the long walk look at st george's gate edward the third's renovated tower and the octagon tower beyond it look at all these and if they fail to excite a due appreciation of the genius that conceived them gaze at the triumph of the whole and which lords over all the rest the round tower gaze at it and not here alone but from the heights of the great park from the vistas of the home park from the bowers of eton the meads of cluer and dutchet from the brocus the gardens of the naval knights from a hundred points view it at sunrise when the royal standard is hoisted or at sunset when it is lowered near or at a distance and it will be admitted to be the work of a prodigious architect but wyattville's alterations have not yet been fully considered pass through st george's gateway and enter the grand quadrangle to which it leads let your eye wander round it beginning with the inner sides of edward the third's tower and george the fourth's gateway and proceeding to the beautiful private entrance to the sovereign's apartments the grand range of windows of the eastern corridor the proud towers of the gateway to the household the tall pointed windows of st george's hall the state entrance tower with its noble windows until it finally rests upon the stuart buildings and king john's tower at the angle of the pile internally the alterations made by the architects have been of corresponding splendour and importance around the south and east sides of the court at which you are gazing a spacious corridor has been constructed five hundred and fifty feet in length and connected with the different suites of apartments on these sides of the quadrangle extensive alterations have been made in the domestic offices the state apartments have been repaired and rearranged st george's hall has been enlarged by the addition of a private chapel the only questionable change and restored to the gothic style and the waterloo chamber built to contain george the fourth's munificent gift to the nation of the splendid collection of portraits now occupying it the first and most remarkable characteristic of operations of sir geoffrey wyatville on the exterior observes mr pointer is the judgment with which he has preserved the castle of edward the third some additions have been made to it and with striking effect as the brunswick tower and the western tower of george the fourth's gateway which so nobly terminates the approach from the great park the more modern buildings on the north side have also been assimilated to the rest but the architect has yielded to no temptation to substitute his own design for that of william of wykeham and no small difficulties have been combated and overcome for the sake of preserving the outline of the edifice and maintaining the towers in their original position the winchester tower originally inhabited by william of wykeham was bestowed upon sir geoffrey wyattville as a residence by george the fourth and on the resignation of the distinguished architect was continued to him for life by the present queen the works within the castle were continued during the reign of william the fourth and at its close the actual cost of the buildings had reached the sum of seven hundred seventy one thousand pounds and it has been asserted that the general expenditure up to the present time has exceeded a million and a half of money the view from the summit of the round tower is beyond description magnificent and commands twelve counties namely middlesex essex hereford berks bucks oxford wilts hants surrey sussex kent and bedford while on a clear day the dome of st paul's may be distinguished from it this tower was raised thirty-three feet by sir geoffrey wyattville crowned with a machicolated battlement and surmounted with a flag tower 
the circumference of the castle is four thousand one hundred eighty feet the length from east to west one thousand four hundred eighty feet and the area exclusive of the terraces about twelve acres for the present the works are suspended but it is to be hoped that the design of sir geoffrey wyatville will be fully carried out in the lower ward by the removal of such houses on the north as would lay st george's chapel open to view from this side by the demolition of the old incongruous buildings lying westward of the bastion near the hundred steps by the opening out of the pointed roof of the library the repair and reconstruction in their original style of the curfew the garter and the salisbury towers and the erection of a lower terrace extending outside the castle from the bastion above mentioned to the point of termination of the improvements and accessible from the town the construction of which terrace would necessitate the removal of the disfiguring and encroaching houses on the east side of thames street this accomplished crane's ugly buildings removed and the three western towers laid open to the court the horseshoe cloisters consistently repaired windsor castle would indeed be complete and fervently do we hope that this desirable event may be identified with the reign of victoria end of chapter five thus ends the third book of the chronicle of windsor castle